Well, good morning. It's great to see you here in chapel today. We welcome those who are on campus as well as those who are joining us online. We're pleased today to have uh, Dr. Donovan Burton, Professor of Biblical Counseling here at Clear Creek, who will be our chapel speaker today. And so we look forward to him preaching um, the word of the Lord for us and to us here today that we can feast upon the bread of life. Unspoken prayer request, show of hands. Amen. Let's pray and I'll get out of the way and we'll worship King Jesus. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day, Lord, for every blessing that you have bestowed upon us. We thank you most of all for your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace that was demonstrated toward us, even yet while we were sinners, Father. We rejoice in that today. Lord, I pray you to lift every burden that's in this room. I pray that you would heal all forms of sickness, illness, and injury, Father. I pray that you'd give strength to those today that feel like they're running out of energy, who feel like that the semester's just too much for them to bear. Father, may you just help us, Lord, to continue on this journey that we are on. Lord, bring salvation to the lost, we pray, and use us, Father, to do the work of evangelists that we might win the world to Christ. We pray and ask these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, Clear Creek. Let's stand together and worship our Savior. built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm He is Lord Lord of all When darkness seems to hide His face on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within the veil Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. And He is Lord, Lord. sound oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone 
faultless stand before the throne. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea
give the Lord praise, church. Thank you, Father. Now we're going to enter into our time of prayer. And during this time, I'd like to specifically ask us to be praying for Brother Allen and Cindy, Lord, uh, in the uh, loss of his father. And right now, wherever they are, I just pray they feel our prayers for them. And all those that are going through hurt and loss, I pray that we lift them up as brothers and sisters in Christ and they never feel alone. So join me now as we pray for them. Share a bim and say. 
Most holy, precious Father, we come to you and we thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our precious Trinity. God, I pray we never lose sight of the theology that we sing. And God, I thank you so much for our brothers and sisters in Christ taking time out of their day, Lord, knowing that for some it may be required, but God, it should never be a requirement to sing your praises to you, Lord Father. And so this morning, I pray that that offering of praise went to you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, now as we end the time of musical worship and enter into worship through your word, come boldly upon Dr. Burton. Let him come here with your word for us today and help us leave changed and not the same as we came in. In Jesus' holy and precious name, we pray this. Amen. Well, thank you for your faithfulness on a cold winter's day. And what we just experienced, it is well with my soul. Best acoustics in the Southern Baptist Convention right here, I believe. I mean, you rock the rafters. For your encouragement today, the familiar call of Gideon in Judges 6. Judges in chapter 6. But first, turtle and eagle. Turtle and Eagle had been friends for many years, and as was now their daily custom, they would meet every day on Turtle's Rock for a little friendly conversation. And on this particular day, Turtle just seemed not to be quite himself as he looked to Eagle. What's the bother, Turtle? asked Eagle. I've been doing a lot of thinking, Eagle, said Turtle, about how we're different and the things that I wish I could change. Well, what would you change, Eagle asked him. He said, well, you've got wings, and all I've got is this shell, and that means that you can fly, and all I can do is crawl around here down on the ground. So that's what you would change, asked Eagle. If you had one wish, that's, that's what you would ask for? Yep, says Turtle, that would be it. Top of my list, I wish I could fly. Well, this went on for several hours, and several hours then became several days. I wish I could fly was at the top of Turtle's mind and always on his tongue. And on one great day, Eagle, hearing all he could stand to bear about it, swooped up into the air, soared on top of Turtle, dug in his talons and grabbed him up by the shell and shot straight up into the sky. Woo! Screamed Turtle, this is great. This is great. This is what I always wanted, just to be able to fly. With that, Eagle let go of Turtle, <laughs> midair, who promptly flipped, <laughs> shell down, and begins to free fall back to earth. His little legs kicking. Eagle tucked his beak down into a dive so he could head down right alongside Turtle and Asked him, Turtle, Turtle, did you, did you get what you wished for? What do you wish most for now? More flying? No, no, Eagle, said Turtle. No more flying. Landing gear. <laughs> I wish for landing gear. You see, what we can hear is first and foremost comparison of ourselves to others, which is so easy in ministry is a deadly enterprise. God hasn't fashioned all of us to fly because turtles don't have landing gear. So that sometimes when we come to realize that truth, in the simplest and most profound sense, you repent and you change your mind. Or maybe like turtle, you have it changed for you about what you want most, and what you are meant to be. And as I look back over the many things that I have had the opportunity to share in in ministry, and the many things I really wanted to be as a result of that, like Turtle, I have to say I have some repentances. I have some changes of my mind. I wish now that I had spent less time in envy of the eagles. And I had taken more comfort in the homes and the shells and the chores that came with them that God had given me. And one of the distinct ways as I thought about this 
not too long ago that, that would have been displayed each week, that change, that repentance, would have been to bring a greater encouragement to others. Looking back, I wish I had been a better encourager of others. So I've repented and have changed my mind. And it's okay today that I don't have to fly. I don't have to fly, but I sure want you to believe that you can. That's how I would change. Now, my purpose today that I want you and I to see in Judges 6, and again, the familiar call of Gideon, is to open up the largest bag of ministry encouragement that I can haul into this place, and I want to sow it and scatter it as far as I can. And so in Judges 6, if you look with me in verse 11, for your encouragement, not for my flight. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Aphra, which belonged to Joash, the Abbi Ezrite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. First see, for your encouragement, that when God called Gideon, he did so not with respect to who he was and where he was, but what he would yet be. He comes to him as a hiding wheat thresher and says, Hail, mighty man of valor. Hello, mighty warrior. Again, not with respect to who he is or where he is, but what he will be. Encouraging then, encouraging then that the mercies and purposes of God aren't given to you and I on merit of what we are, but they are given to us instead by what he knows we will be. The mercy of God is shed on you and I, not on merit of who we are, but on what he knows we will be. So that in the depths of that providence, God's call comes and salutes one like Gideon, hail mighty man of valor, when he is as yet nothing of the sort. Nothing could be further from the truth. Looked at it from human perspective. That God would come to Gideon again, hiding out a hiding wheat thresher and declare him to be and call him to be a mighty man of valor. Now, friends, don't let it escape you and I that he has come to us. Maybe in less certainty of an angel, although I would point out that the call of an angel, that realization alone wasn't confirmation enough to get Gideon to see beyond the chaff floor, was it? The fact that an angel came to him wasn't enough. But God has come to you and I again, maybe with that less certainty, but this is what I believe he says to you. He says, hello, mighty scholar. Hail, mighty scholar. Verse 13, Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Hail, mighty man of valor. And Gideon protests. How? How forsaken? How surrounded by Midian? Me, from the weakest clan, Manasseh, not to mention 
that in that clan of Manasseh, in my father's house, I am the lowest. Surely, <laughs> this is no time for jokes and jest. Angel, hail, mighty man of valor. Hail, scholar, mighty scholar. And you say, me, <laughs> from my little soup can town, <laughs> I came to Pineville dragging my hand-me-down car. I came from a high school. It's not so much that I, they graduated me as they let me escape. That's how I got out of high school. Me, go to college. It really is absurd. It's absurd to you. It's absurd to bystanders. It's absurd to your families, maybe, and your friends. Here we are, mighty scholars, knees trembling on the threshing floor, Midian at the gate every Monday. The ghost of Kate Turabian frowning at my broken sentence on a page. I figure, I figure I've got enough this week to afford an egg for breakfast if somebody else has the strength to break it. And you want me to go to college? And you want me to go even beyond? Not just be a bachelor, but a master, even a doctor. How be it, Gideon says, that I could do this thing, save Israel? How be it, go to college and beyond? Oh, listen. Listen to what the Lord teaches us from Gideon. I'll say it to us again. He didn't call you on the form of what you are. He called you on what he holds up you can be. You are not here today on the form of what you are. You are here on the form of what he knows you can be. So that means today, when he comes to you and I again and says, Oh, good morning, mighty scholars. And we say, Me, least, last, lowest. You stand on the promise of God and you stare that day right in the face. You stare it in the face, and you stare it in the face through the sweat, through the tears, through the doubts, through the fears, through the anxieties, through the depressions. You stare that day in the face through the outright terror of the whole thing. I am terrified to be in front of you this morning. But you stare right in the face of that terror and you seize it up in the collar and you get nose to nose with it and this is what you have to spit out because you believe it because God said it. You spit out who he calls, he seeks. What he calls, he wills. When he calls, he makes. And so help me God, I am that. I am that. And I will be that. And I am becoming that. I'm not what I was. I'm not what I ought to be. And I'm not yet what I will be. But he came to me on the floor and he said, go. So here we are. Mighty scholars. The Lord is with you. He is in you. And you must take this at the first. 
I'm not here because of what I am. I'm here because of what he knows I will yet be. And you can be that today, and I can be that today. And this will throw you, make no mistake, I would be remiss if I didn't mention today that this that has come upon our lives, that has brought us here together in this room, this will throw us right into doing the very things that hit us and terrified us from the very start. The very thing that you fear most will happen to you in ministry. I'll make no mistake or apology about that. I started off in ministry. I had very little, if any, experience in that world. And I could see very quickly on my horizon. I said, oh, Lord, I'm scared to death to preside over my first funeral. I'd been a participant as a family member, as, a, as one who grieved. I'd never led a funeral. And I prayed to the, oh, Lord, don't, please don't, please don't, not, not in these first few years. Don't, don't send me to a funeral. Notwithstanding a funeral of a lost stranger, and that was the Lord's first move. <laughs> Here, go preside over a funeral of someone you don't know and have no hope over. You are going to be called, and you are already called, to fearsome and awesomely impossible things. We are. Midian is at the gates. Always. But know this, he cannot be defeated on the wheat floor. You've got to meet him at the door. With God, you've got to get off the wheat floor and you've got to meet Midian at the door. And you meet that today. Now look with me for the sake of time down at verse 25 and let's see how this unfolds in the life of Gideon. I'll not make it two words in. That night. <laughs> How about that? For divine timing. That very night, I just got out of hiding on the threshing floor. God's call has come and announced and greeted me as a mighty man of valor. And that night, here comes the to-do list. The absurdity the immediacy, the impossibility to prepare, it comes that night. And you feel that this morning. You feel that right now. If you say you're ready, you're a fool. <laughs> you're here and you say, how'd I get here? <laughs> you're signed up for things you say, I have no business. <laughs> In this place, I don't know how it happened. Here I am that night. God's plan. That night, the Lord said to him, Go back and hide and take it easy and rest up until you feel your strength and your confidence. No. That night, the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull. And the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. This night, mighty scholar, go and steal your daddy's truck. Take it down to the town square and rip it, rip it all down. And 26, and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you shall cut down. Steal your dad's truck, take it down to the town square, tear everything you find down there down, pile it all up, set the truck on fire. That night. I love what happens next. In verse 27, Gideon is an example. So Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family 
and the men of the town to do it by day. He did it by night. Mighty scholar, mighty ministers of God, even if you have to do it under cover of darkness and you have to take 10 with you, it's worth doing. Even if you have to hide under the cover of darkness and get 10 others to watch your back while you do it, if God says do the thing, you do it. It's worth doing. Do the ministry, not because you're good at it, but because it's a good thing that needs doing. Amen. Did you hear that? Do it not because you're good at it. You're going to do it because it's a good thing that must be done. We halt, we stop, we freeze, we fear too much by asking Am I any good? Don't ask today, am I any good? Ask instead, is it a good thing to do? Because if it's a good thing to do, it must be done by those that God has called to do it. A good thing attempted because it is a good thing and it should be done by someone and God has called you to be someone cannot be a failure. Stop asking, am I any good? Instead, look at the thing and say, is that a good godly thing to do? Then it must be done by someone, and God has called me to be a someone, and therefore it must, it must be done. Preach the word. If you're the slowest tongue in the room, preach it. Preach it when you stand up here and your knees are a tremble. Preach it when you go to the bookshelf of words and it's empty. Preach it, preach it when you can't get enough spit in your mouth. Is that all dried up? Preach it. Sing the song. When everybody else is carrying their tunes in silk purses, and yours is in the old backpack, then bring the backpack with you. And sing the song anyway. Carry the cross. Even when darkness and hell is all around and Midian's at the gates, carry the cross. Carry the cross even if it takes 10 other people standing underneath you to get your arm and your hand upon it, carry the cross. If you got to take 10 others with you and you got to carry it out under cover of darkness, carry the cross. Why? Because I'm good at it? God forbid. Because it's a good thing that must be done. The word must be preached. The song must be sung. The cross must be carried. It's a good thing that God has called us to. And we're not good at it. But he didn't call us because of what we are. He called us because of what we will be. Now, if we're not called, if you're not called... If we're not called, if I'm not called, then let's go home and go back to our hiding. If we're not called, we need to go home. And we need to thresh out more wheat and discern what God has in store for our lives if we're not called. But if we are called, then forward. Forward. With our God, it's not only possible, it's inevitable. If we're called, then forward we go. Close us with the Apostle Paul's words here in 1 Corinthians in chapter 1. Familiar passage, verses 26 down to 28. Very much with Gideon in my heart and in my, uh, my mind at least this morning. Paul says, for consider your calling, brothers... Not many of you 
were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. Not many. I look around and I say, not any. Not any? <laughs> not any of you were wise. Not any of you were powerful. Not any of you were of noble birth. But God chose. I can't go any further. But God chose. What are you doing over here in the mountains? Are you in the mountains because you're of noble birth? That's not what they say of us. I'm not trying to be unkind. I am trying to be realistic. They don't look to the mountains. They don't look to you and I and say, there go some people of noble birth. <clears throat> there go some powerful people. Where are you on the power list of Southern Baptist influencers? They don't look to us and say, there go the wise doesn't say on my door, Donovan the wise. But God chose. I'd rather all those things not be said and have instead people look to us and say, that's a God-chosen people. Yeah. In a God-chosen place doing a God-called good work. Yes. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. Foolish, weak, are you low, despised? then consider what God has chosen. A shame to the wise is what you are. You bring the wise to shame by what God does through you. A shame to the strong because when you are weak, he's still strong. He's still God. We bring the world to nothing because it already is <laughs> so that it may boast in who? Not in us, not in you, not in books and learning, not in Clear Creek, not in a church, not in a personality, not in a pastor, not in an articulate message or an award-winning song so that it may boast in Christ. And so bring us to nothing so that he may be everything. For your encouragement today, brothers, sisters, for your encouragement today, God has called you not on virtue of what you are, but what he knows you will be. You are doing great, mighty, awesome, impossible, fearful things that tremble you still on the floor. But God is called. Amen. And He's chosen you. And that is to your great encouragement. Brother, sister, Mighty ones. I greet you today and I say, Oh, mighty scholar. Oh, mighty preacher. Oh, mighty minister. Oh, mighty missionary. For your encouragement. 
God has called. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, Lord, protect us from the regret of envy and comparison. We're not made to be eagles because we have short, stubby feet and shells. Lord, you didn't call us all to fly and to be at the top. We were shaking on the floor, surrounded by the enemy, and you came to us, not wise, not of noble birth, not of strength or might. You came to us so that we might bring this world to nothing in the name of Christ. And for those that are here under that call, Lord, I pray that you would be a blessed and mighty encouragement to them this very minute. Father, they're afraid. They're tired. They're weak. Some of them have been sick. They're poor. They're mocked and laughed at and scorned by others. At best, they're looked at by bewilderment from their own friends and family. But they hear God because someday you sent a message to them and said, go. And so, Father, strengthen them to know that you've called them not because of any virtue of what they are, but what you know they will be. And that is a glorious truth to behold on a dark and dreary day. And so, Father, we thank you that you are all the things that we shall never be. And we thank you that you've seen us, you've saw fit to call us and use us. And because of that, Lord, what seems now to be impossible will only be inevitable through you. And so encourage each one today, a brother, a sister, a mighty scholar, a mighty minister, a mighty man and woman of valor, make them, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, send us forth. Amen.